Okay. Hatazinu Givia, which contains the song of um, Moshe. Okay. This Parsha describes Jehovah's people in many terms that are not very glowing. They're blemished. The crooked and twisted generation. They're referred to as you foolish and senseless people. They stared him to jealousy with strange gods. You forgot the God who gave you birth. A perverse generation, children in whom there is no faithfulness. Amunah is that word. And we'll be um, looking at that as we go along. They are a nation void of counsel and there is no understanding in them. This Parsha will describe the events that demonstrate Yehovah's great frustration with his people. And also his great compassion for them. He said, they have made me jealous with what is no God. And I will heap disasters upon them. Outdoors the sword shall bereave, and indoors there will be terror. And speaking of the enemies of his people, he says, Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip. And it says, Yehovah will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone. So, we're going to have it mapped out for us that his people are going to go astray, make him jealous with other gods, then there will be trouble for them. And then those people that he uses as instruments of his as his judgment the Lord will deal with them too he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries so Song of Moshe gives us a good perspective on where most of those calling themselves God's people are at right now it's interesting the way it describes the people and what they're up to it says they've made me jealous with what is no God the Lord says what does he say he says I will heap disasters upon them we know if we look at the book of Revelation that trouble is coming and also through the Gospels. Jehovah, that will have compassion on them. <clears throat> Revelation 3.9, we know that the Lord says this. Oh my love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. And why does he want them to, <clears throat> to go through this whole process of the tribulation? To bring him to this point where they do repent so that what? A great multitude that no one could number from every nation would be clothed in white robes. In Deuteronomy 32, we see this. I will proclaim the name of Yehovah, ascribe greatness to our God. In this, in this portion, Moshe will proclaim the name, i.e. the character of Yehovah. Moshe will list Yehovah's attributes of faithfulness, righteousness, justice, and uprightness. Moshe calls us to recognize Yehovah's greatness. We look at the Psalms, it says, For I know that Yehovah is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever Yehovah pleases, he does. That's something that should really make people think. In heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. It is a good thing to know the name or the character of Yehovah. It says in Psalm 91, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He knows my character. He knows all about me. He knows where I'm at. He knows who I am. When he calls to me, I'll answer him. I will be, in, I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Bear in mind what the Song of Moshe points towards. It points towards the people who've gone astray, just like people have gone astray today. And it talks about them receiving the judgment. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. But here, the ones who are protected are the ones who know his name, who know exactly who he is. And if you want to know his name, turn to his word. Now, before diving straight into the song itself, let's have a quick look at some scriptures that lead us into it. Deuteronomy 31. Yehovah said to Moshe, Behold, you're about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. And they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day. And I will forsake them and I will hide my face from them. And they will be devoured. And many evils and troubles will come upon them. So that they will say in that day. Have not these evils come upon us. Because our God is not among us. And I will surely hide my face in that day. Because of all the evil that they have done. Because they have turned to other gods. So. 
As we've mentioned before, this hide my face sounds like it's Yehovah repeating himself, but it isn't. There's a cycle. Element A, the people abandon their God in Yehovah and they chase after other gods. Element B, Yehovah hides his face. Element C, the people remember their God and they say it's because God is not with us that these things have happened. He's abandoned us. That's what's going on. That's why it's happening. But Yehovah continues to hide his face. So why does Yehovah continue to hide his face? Because the people only went back to element B. They only went back to this, where they recognize that he's hiding his face. Okay, they didn't look to element A and the reason why Yehovah hid his face. This was not repentance, it was a half-baked act of self-pity. That is why Yehovah continued to hide his face. Oh, where's he gone? What's he done? Failing to recognize their part and what they've done. What is described as a people who fail to see their part and all that has come upon them? They are not concerned as to how they have treated Yehovah. They're more concerned about themselves. And we see this inability to accept culpability reflected in Psalm 44. It says, You have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You've made us turn back from the foe and those who hate us have gotten spoil. You've made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You've sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You've made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You've made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock. The shaking of the head is actually what the Hebrew is suggesting, among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me and shame has covered my face. The sound of the taunted and reviled at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, and then they say this, that we had not forgotten you and we have not been false to your covenant. So Yehovah promises Israel blessings for obedience and in his word he clearly outlines the curses that will come upon his people if they walk in disobedience. The cry of we have done no wrong is at its very best short-sighted. It says our heart has not turned back nor have we nor our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not he discover this for he knows the secrets of the heart? It reminds me when I read this of um, so many people that you'll speak to who completely and utterly fail to recognize that the way they treat Yehovah is wrong. And they're just like, no, I'm perfect, I'm, everything's cool. So here we have the plea of innocence mixed with the description of the curses that Yehovah has promised for disobedience. So many people fail to see that they walk in error. <clears throat> it says in Hebrews 3, Exhort one another every day as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long and we're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, verse 22 is quoted in Romans 8, 36 to 39, which outlines that for those of us who have returned to Yehovah, nothing including persecution shall separate us from the love of Christ. And this was written by Paul to those suffering persecution for their faith. And this is not the same as suffering for disobedience. Yehovah is not hiding his face here. He is ever present. And if any of you have ever gone through some sort of persecution for your faith, for making a stand for Yehovah, you'll completely understand what I'm on about. You're more than ever aware that he is right there with you. So, examine yourself. <clears throat> And ask yourself, how are your robes looking? So many people think they're absolutely pristine, white, and doing everything perfect and wonderful and everything, but examine yourselves. Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. This is the cry of the people. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? Yehovah hides his face from those who have not confessed their iniquity and turned in repentance. In Isaiah 59 it says, Behold, Yehovah's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Proverbs 28. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. This is what the Lord would require of those who are walking in error. Psalm 34, I will bless Yehovah at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in Yehovah. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify Yehovah with me and let us exalt his name together. And I read that and it just reminded me what Moshe declared. And he said, ascribe greatness to our God. 
I sought Yehovah and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. In other words, he did not hide his face. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and Yehovah heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of Yehovah encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So those who fear him are those who are obedient, as JP was going into last week, those who, shema, those who ascribe greatness to him and to his word. The eyes of Yehovah are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of Yehovah is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but Yehovah delivers him out of all of them. In other words, you might go through some tough times, but Yehovah will be there with you the whole way. It's sin that causes Yehovah to hide his face, but Yehovah hears the righteous. So many carry on in sin, refusing to repent, and then wonder why Yehovah is far from them when troubles come. And many of them claim, what have we done wrong? We've done nothing wrong. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He is bent and readied his boat. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Okay, indignation is at arm. Properly, to foam at the mouth, to be enraged, to abhor, abominable, angry, defy. This is strong language. Behold, a wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. The sin brings consequences. Ecclesiastes. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Now a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it would be well with who? With those who fear Yahweh, fear God, because they fear before him. But this... So many people who walk in error and think everything's fine and oh, it's all going on well. Oh, I'm doing really good. But there are consequences for sin that are not always immediate. He makes a pit, digging it out and falls into the hole that he has made. As many people call themselves his people who walk in sin, who walk in error think they're doing really well, really fantastic, who would claim, oh, I'm not doing anything wrong, and trouble will come, and they will cry out too, and they will say, what, what have we done, what have we done? This tribulation will come, those calling themselves God's people will cry out and wonder why Yehovah hides his face. Many of them will claim that they are without fault, and they will cry out, awake, why are you sleeping, O oh Lord? So ask yourself, where are you to be found? You personally, yourself. Are you to be found amongst the righteous? Or amongst those trying to convince themselves and everybody else that they are righteous while walking with sin in their lives? Ask yourself, how are your robes looking? Psalm 50. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Throughout this part, you can see scriptures that tell us exactly who it is that Yehovah responds to, exactly who it is who he's with. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statue to take my covenant on your lips? Please note that there are people who recite his statutes, take his covenant on their lips, who the Lord describes as wicked. You hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. These are people... Again, I can point out, he recites his statutes and take his covenant on their lips. Yet when it suits them, they cast his words away. For those who think to appease Yehovah, by the way, by just holding on to sin, it won't work. It just will not work. For all those who like to recite his statutes, but yet yeah, cast his words behind them, and then make some great show of, oh, we love Lord, oh, we love him and all. It just will not work. He will not be impressed. All your religious efforts will matter not a jot if you haven't surrendered totally to Yehovah, if your heart doesn't belong to him. All this, oh, big gestures and statements matter not. 
What right have you to recite my statue, to take my covenant on your lips, is what Jehovah says. For those who would cast his words behind them when it suits them. Thus says Jehovah, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. He would not even dare to think to cast any of my words away. He who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. And I just think, he who makes these great big long posts about how much he loves the Lord and all this and all that caper. It's like one who breaks a dog's neck. It just means nothing to Jehovah if your heart is not surrendered to him. He who presents a grain offering like one who offers pig's blood. He who makes a memorial offering of frankincense like one who blesses an idol. In other words, to the Lord, it's actually quite abhorrent. These have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. They've gone their own way. They'll still claim to be his and they'll still claim when trouble comes to have done absolutely nothing wrong. And they'll recite his statutes and they'll talk about his covenant. It'll be on their lips. I also will choose harsh treatment for them and bring their fears upon them because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not listen. They would not shima. But they did what was evil in my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. Hear the word of Jehovah, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, Let Jehovah be glorified that we may see you joy. But it is they who will be put to shame. So he says, I will choose harsh treatment for them and I'll bring their fears upon them. And from the song of Moshe we'll read this. I will heap disasters upon them and I will spend my arrows upon them. They shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I'll send the teeth of beasts against them with the venom of things that crawl in the dust. Outdoors the, sh the sword shall bereave and indoors tear it. For young man and woman alike, the nurse and child with the man of grey hairs. For everybody. Deuteronomy 31. Therefore write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. So all these things that we read in this song, the Lord's got a purpose for. And the function of a witness is not just to convict one party, but also to vindicate another. While the song of Moshe determines the guilt of the children of Israel, it also testifies to the justice and the faithfulness of Jehovah. Deuteronomy 31. For when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten on a full and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me they will hate me and they will break my covenant so <clears throat> the lord's taken this people he's promised them a land and he's given them this land and what do they do they go in they're blessed everything's cool oh this is brilliant and they forget him it says they despise him they're doing well they've grown fat but yet they turn to other gods so danger when everything is going well and there is abundance, there is danger, it would appear, for those calling themselves his people. As they will eat, grow fat, and forget Jehovah and turn to other gods. And we see this in Deuteronomy 8 as well. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless Jehovah your Elohim for the good land which he has given you. So when I have blessed you and I have given you all these things, make sure to do this. Beware that you do not forget Jehovah. Your Elohim. Mm -hmm. So, Jehovah will bless them, and despite the warning he has given them, they will repay him by forgetting him when everything is going well. And it's not just in the hard times that reveal what's in our hearts, is it? Now, in Parsha Kitavo, we see what is commanded when bringing the first fruits to Jehovah. A declaration was to be made that showed that the one bringing the offering understood that it was due to Yehovah that he had prospered. The worshipper would recite a liturgy that contained a potted history of how he came to be stood before the priest with his offering. Okay, so this man's coming before the Lord with his offering. And with the feast coming up, it is a good time for us to consider how we got to be where we're at too. All the things that have gone before us that have brought us to the place that we're at. Deuteronomy 26 says this, Then you shall make response before Jehovah your God. So this is what the person bringing the offering was to say. A Syrian ready to perish was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few, and became there a nation great 
mighty and populous. Now, as we go on, I want people to start to appreciate that um, what he's going to recite, it's actually our history too because we actually belong to the nation of Israel. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to Jehovah, the God of our fathers, and Jehovah heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And Jehovah brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and with wonders. Please remember that all the things that was promised to this guy is the things that are promised to us. We can identify with this person. We were also once slaves that were rescued by an outstretched arm, and in each of our lives he has wrought many wonderful deeds. Would you agree? We see that we've been rescued. Romans 6 outlines it. Thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of these things, those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. Jehovah has rescued you and you are part of his kingdom. These are things that you should recognize. And the spotted history culminates in the following verses. It says, And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, the land flowing with milk and honey, a brilliant place. He's really looked after. He's blessed us incredibly. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Jehovah, have given me. All this good stuff, it's thanks to you that I have it. And you shall set it down before Jehovah your God and worship before Jehovah your God. So here he is, the man who's bringing his offering, recognizing that all these good things come from Jehovah. He says, and you shall rejoice in all the good that Jehovah your God has given to you and your house, the Levite, the sojourner who is among you. So the command is to rejoice. The Living Waters commentary says this, In doing this ritual, the Israelite declares that he is not ungrateful. He is recognizing not only where he has come from, but also the Almighty, that the Almighty who has consistently guided him. Despite all odds, because of the Almighty's kindness and graciousness, the Israelites were able to come in and possess the land. And as a conclusion to this process, they are commanded to rejoice. Gratitude leads to joy. And when one sees the physical fruit of one's labor, an appreciation of Yehovah, Elohim of our fathers, must be part of the experience. If not, then one has failed to see Yehovah's enabling role in all of man's um, accomplishments. And you shall rejoice in all the good that Yehovah your God has given to you, and you and your house, and the Levites, and the sojourner who is among you. Okay, what was the thing in the Song of Moshe that the people are accused of doing, that's accused of going after other gods? When did they do this, when everything is going well? And they forget their God. Why do they forget their God? Because they didn't do what he said. To come before him and recognize his hand in all the things that he has given them. But if we go focus on all that Jehovah has done for us, it does begin, obviously, with remembering that he's rescued us. The first of the ten words reminds us of the importance of recognizing that Jehovah is our Elohim and that he rescued us. Exodus 20 says, God spoke all these words saying, I am Jehovah your God. He brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And part of this remembrance that we were rescued is keeping the Sabbath. Deuteronomy 5 says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and Jehovah your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yehovah, your God, commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So we remember Yehovah as our rescuer and we rejoice in all the good things that he has blessed us with. Because we don't want to forget about him, do we? And we give thanks. In fact, we give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Yeshua HaMashiach for you. Now, when Pasha Kitivo, Tavo, the one bringing the offering, also recites a second liturgy in which he states this. I have not transgressed any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten. And in the English it says, nor have I forgotten them. But that is not actually there. In the verse 13, the Hebrew literally says, I have not forgotten, period. What was the claim against the people in the Song of Moshe? It actually says, "What you forgot the God who gave you birth. Now, 
the guy says, I have not forgot. And that's interesting because we connect it with what we read in Deuteronomy 8. When it said, you've come in, you've eaten full, you shall bless Jehovah your Elohim for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget your Elohim. So this guy brings his offer and he thanks the Lord for it. And in doing all this, he does exactly what the Lord tells him to do. He remembers Jehovah. He declares then, I have not forgot. Our tendency to forget seems to be an occupational hazard of receiving his blessings. But Psalm 50 says this, Mark this, then you forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as a sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Again, throughout this passage, we'll see the people that Jehovah responds to and those that he doesn't. And from the Song of Moshe, just ruin, grew fat and kick. You grew fat, stout and sleek. Okay. Just as we read, go into the land, all these things that you're given. But then what did he do? Then he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you. And what did you do? You forgot the God who gave you birth. You forgot the very thing the Lord says, beware that you do not forget. And how are they to remember? By recognizing Yehovah's hand in all the good that he's given them in their lives. But what do people do when things are going great and going well? Oh no, that's just, I'm not going to remember the Lord. I'm not going to honor him in these things. You grew fat, stout, and sleek. And this puts me in mind of Revelation 3. I know your works, you're neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. But because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have prospered. You're doing really great and all that, but look at the state of you spiritually. And you say I need nothing, <clears throat> not realizing that you were wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Again, pointing to a bunch of people who think they're doing great. Oh, everything's good. I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. And the charge from the song was, then he forsook God who made him, like so many do. And go after a crazy God of their own imagining because they forget the name of Jehovah. Those calling themselves Jehovah's people are just behaving as they always do. Deuteronomy 31, as we read, brought them into the land, flowing with milk and honey. I swore to give their fathers. They've eaten, they've grown fat, and then they turn to other gods and serve them and despise me and break my covenant. Things go well. They forget their God, they go after other gods. We're commanded to remember our Elohim and rejoice for all that he has done for us. This is a commandment. You are not to forget your Elohim. Yet so many do. It's even in the Song of Moshe. Telling us that's exactly what happens. You shall rejoice. And this begins with acknowledging that you've been rescued. That you have life. So many people forget this don't they truly truly I say to you whoever hears my word and believes and we're going to look at that statement that word him who sent me as eternal life he does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life please accept that we are never without reason to give thanks to Jehovah never just that statement alone we've been shown such great love God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Yeshua HaMashiach. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Yeshua HaMashiach. And for those with needs, remember this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everybody. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So many people lack that element, don't they? That thanksgiving, despite all of God's great goodness. Those who have gratitude are those who do not forget their God. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. So in one body. We belong one to another. We are no longer just individuals. We are part of Yehovah's holy nation. 
And often we fail to see ourselves as belonging to Jehovah's nation. We fail to identify with its history. You see the scriptures telling stories about people who lived a long time ago rather than giving us an account of our forefathers. And when we read about the nation of Israel and we see it in the Song of Moshe, we fail to recognize, wow, who's this talking about? Us. Being an Israelite, the individual bringing his offering begins to recite the history. He acknowledges himself as part of the whole of Israel. And only after he's completed the historical review does he move back to the singular in verse 10. So, he says, I declare, they mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid the bondage on us. So this is like he's recognizing himself as a part of a group. And then he says, I have brought the first fruits given to me. Back to him being a person on his own. I've brought these because I recognize I'm a part of this whole group. I'm a part of the whole thing that you've done, Yehovah. And then, rejoicing which is done collectively. When we accept the redemption that is available to us individually through Yeshua the Messiah, then we become a part of the community of Israel whose Elohim is the same as the Elohim of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Galatians 3, if you're Christ and you're Abraham's seed, as according to the promise. So all this stuff that this little farmer guy is supposed to speak about, this is what happened, and he rescued us and he did all this. This is our history too. Ephesians 2. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But you're not now. You're a part of it. This is about you. This song is all about you. It's all about us. Our salvation in Yeshua is personal and there are certain blessings and curses that apply individually. However, Israel is a body of Messiah made up of individuals. It is possible when the nation is disciplined for righteous individuals to be affected right along with the wicked. The cumulative effect of individuals being disobedient puts the entire nation at risk. The Song of Moshe will outline some terrible woes that will come upon the people. And it's worth noting what Moshe has already stated with regards to the curses and failing to be thankful for all that Yehovah has done for us. For these curses that are going to come. What did we read? You shall rejoice in all the good that Yehovah your God has given you. So we are to be thankful for all that he has done for us. This, of course, is related to the bringing of the tithe and the first fruits. Because this is all part of recognizing that it is Yehovah who watches over you and protects you and provides for you. In doing this, we acknowledge that Yehovah is our provider. We bring our tithes and first fruits, and with thanksgiving, we rejoice before our Elohim with those we share the blessings with. What does it mean to rejoice? And the word there is samach. The word rejoice samach appears again as a command when we come across the construction of the altar on Mount Abel. So you'll build with whole stones the altar of Yehovah your Elohim and offer burns offerings on it to Yehovah your Elohim. She'll offer peace offerings and she'll eat there and rejoice. The word is samach again. The thing that we're commanded to do before Yehovah your Elohim. You shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of this Torah. So again, we see here, rejoicing is linked with bringing offerings before Yehovah. We find the same Hebrew word for rejoice, samach, here translated as joy later in Deuteronomy in the midst of the curses. I think this is fascinating. Because you did not serve Yehovah, your Elohim, with joy, the word samach again, with rejoicing, because you didn't do that thing that he asked you to do, and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, for all the goodness that he's offered you and given you and provided for you. Because you refuse to do that. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom Yehovah will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. So you add everything, but then you're going to need everything. Why? Because you failed to serve him with joy. You failed in this regard. You weren't grateful for the abundance of everything and you did not serve Yehovah with joy, with rejoicing. I want you to ask yourself, how are your robes looking? For all those who think they're doing brilliant. Consider carefully what the verses are not saying. They're not saying that these curses will come upon the Israelites for not serving him or not even for not keeping his commandments. Rather, they will come upon Israel for not serving him with joy, 
for not rejoicing, Samak, and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Which, as we've seen, is related to coming before him with your tithes and offerings, recognizing that it's him who provides for you, recognizing that it's him who rescued you, recognizing that it's him who watches over you. There is a connection between rejoicing for the abundance of everything and recognizing with tithes and offerings that it is Jehovah who is the provider. Would you forget Jehovah? Deuteronomy 28, 47 to 28, 48 says that if there is not joy or rejoicing in your service, you'll end up serving your enemies in hunger, thirst, and in nakedness. It says you will be cursed. <clears throat> but let all who take refuge in you rejoice, Samach. Let them sing, ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. Those who know exactly who you are. Again, we see who it is that the Lord responds to. For you bless the righteous, O Yehovah, you cover him with favor as with a shield. Rejoicing before Yehovah and acknowledging him with your tithes and offering is not a financial consideration, by the way. Oh, can I? Can I afford to? Can I not? Oh, hang on a minute. And if I do this and that, and oh, can I? Oh, it's going to be a bit tight. It is not a financial consideration. It's a matter of the heart. You might think to say, oh, I can't afford it. But what you're actually saying is, my heart is hard. And I will fail to rejoice before the Lord as he's asked me to. And you know what? So many are saying exactly that. My heart is hard. So many people. You'd be surprised. How sad. Man is required to recognize the Almighty in all his endeavors. So what happens when we fail to recognize Jehovah as the one to whom all thanks belongs? What happens when we fail to see ourselves as stewards of that which he has been gracious enough to bless us with? Ask yourself, would you rob from Jehovah? Ask yourself, is there a blemish? Will man rob God, yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? This is not a new thing. This has always been a problem with his people. As we can see, his people go through troubles and they're given over to their enemies. And the Lord says, this is exactly part of your problem. Because you did not serve me in the way I asked you to. You are cursed with a curse, for you were robbing me, the whole nation of you. How sad. Not a new thing. And they probably had all their reasons. Oh, I'm not sure it's actually, you know, you know in the scriptures, and maybe it's this, that, and the other. Or maybe, oh, well, yeah, but that was for then, and that was for now. And I'm not a farmer, I'm not actually, whatever. Always a problem. And always the same consequences, because sin has consequences. Sometimes they're not immediate. Sin always has consequences. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says Jehovah Zavayot. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Because you did not serve Jehovah, your Elohim, with joy, with rejoicing, Samach, and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. What did he promise? Curses. All the things that we read about in the Song of Moses. It never goes well when we fail to recognize that it is Jehovah who provides for us, who gives us increase. Jeremiah 5. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear Jehovah our God, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. They fail to recognize that it's Him who actually provides. Your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have kept good from you. So, how did the song go? Talks about a people who are blemished, crooked and twisted, foolish and senseless people, children in whom there is no faithfulness, says there is no understanding in them. They don't recognize that it's Jehovah who brings the rain, who makes things flourish and prosper. Scripture says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will 
of Yeshua HaMashiach for you. Do not quench the spirit. So rejoice always, give thanks. And this is what being blessed is all about. Recognizing the abundance of what Yelvad has done for you and responding with gratitude. You want to know what it's like to be truly blessed? Respond to all that Yehovah has done for you with gratitude. You might not have much, but you have something incredible. Every single one of you. You're a God who loved you so much that he came and he died for you that you might have life. A God who promises to watch over you like a shepherd that watches over sheep. Recognize the abundance of all that he has done for you. With gratitude in your heart. Scripture says though there is no understanding in them. May my meditation be pleasing to him. But I will rejoice, Shemach and Yehovah. Deuteronomy 31 says, And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will be unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know what they are inclined to do, even today before I have brought them into the land that I swore to give them. So Moshe wrote the song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. And the truths embodied in the song of Moshe will rise to the surface during troubled times. When many evils and troubles have come upon them. We know many evils and troubles will come upon those who count themselves as his people who have not had their ransom paid. And it's not just the song of Moshe that is a witness against the people. Deuteronomy 4. When your father, children, and children's children grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of Yehovah your God so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land you're going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but you will be utterly destroyed. And Yehovah will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where Yehovah will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell, things that are completely useless. But from there you will seek Yehovah your God, and you will find him, if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to Jehovah your God and you will obey his voice. When all these troubles come upon you, the words of the song of Moshe will make so much sense to you. For Jehovah your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you nor destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. So when you're in tribulation, all these things come upon you. In the latter days, you will return to Yehovah your God and Shema, his voice. In the latter days, the tribulation will bring people to repentance. Gold tried in the fire. They will Shema, his voice. And I believe that they will remember the warnings and they will turn to Yehovah. And they will recognize themselves. They will see themselves in his writings, in his word. The song testifies the troubles that are a result of the people's actions, details their disloyalty and ingratitude after receiving much from Yehovah. The blame for the troubles that will befall them land squarely on their, or should I say, our own shoulders. Not only will this song serve as a witness against Yehovah's people, but it also is a witness for Yehovah and his great compassion. Deuteronomy 31. Take this book of the Lord and put it by the side of the ark of the covenant of Yehovah your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. You hold even today while I am yet alive with you. You've been rebellious against Jehovah. How much more after my death? Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And in the days to come evil will befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of Jehovah, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. The song will leave no one with the idea that they were not warned. 
Song is prophetic and speaks of those protected by Yelvah. Those who were chastised, chastised by him and talks of the wrath meted out on those who were ultimately judged as enemies. The song has little to do with Moshe at all. It's all about the sovereignty of Yehovah. It's all about his plan and him getting all the glory. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. And give ear is Azan. Often this phrase is used in conjunction with Shema. Where we find in scripture the use of the poetic device known as a Hebrew parallelism. And there's some examples. We see the two things in conjunction. So wherever we read give ear, we can treat this the same way as when we read Shema or Hearken. It says, May my teaching drop as the rain and my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. So the word of Jehovah brings life. Take a barren wasteland, scorch it in a spittable add rain and see what happens. A bit like lives washed in the water of the word. Simon Peter comes to Yeshua, doesn't he? And he says something because he recognizes. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And later in the portion in verse 46 and 7, it reads, Be careful to do all the words of this law, for it is no empty word for you, but your very life. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The name of Yehovah is his character. And as priests, those who kahan, this is what we are called to do, to proclaim his name, exactly who he is. In 1 Peter 2, 9, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his own possession, that you do what? You proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Please note how Yehovah proclaimed his name to Moshe on Mount Sinai. It says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yehovah. Yehovah passed before him and proclaimed, Yehovah, Yehovah, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So, Jehovah, gracious, kind, and merciful, but also a God of judgment. Hebrews 10. For we know him who sent vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again, Jehovah, the, sorry, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Many tend to shy away from this aspect of who Yehovah is. They don't want to know his name. But it is a good thing to know the name, the character of Yehovah. And if you want to know his name, you turn to his word. But the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have an itch in ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Those calling themselves Jehovah's people have had a habit of this. Jeremiah 5. They prophets prophesy falsely. Priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes? In Isaiah 30, the prophecy we read was given at a time when the Syrian army was attacking Israel and Judah. And Jehovah promises judgment. He says that a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of Jehovah. How familiar does that sound? You say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Tickle our ears. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way, turn aside from the path, and let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Let's make another God up. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach in a high wall, bulging out and about to collapse. This breaking comes suddenly in, a, in an instant. Wow, bang. Just like that, in an instant. This breaking is like that of a potter's vessel that is smashed so ruthlessly that among its fragments, not a shard is found with which to take fire from the hearth or to dip up water out of the cistern. And this fascinates me, because I know in Scripture everything is cyclical. So for these rebellious people... The judgment comes, bang, so quickly. Or they'd be shell-shocked. Whoa, what's going on? We've done nothing wrong. How could this happen? But thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, shuva, and making repentance, 
and rest you shall be saved in quietness and in trust shall be your strength but you were unwilling you said no we will flee upon horses we'll do it in our own strength we shall flee away and we'll ride upon swift steeds. Therefore your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five you shall flee till you are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain like a signal on a hill. And these brings to mind the words of what is written in the Song of Moshe. It's already been written about. And a nation void of counsel there is no understanding in them. If they were wise they would understand this. They would discern their latter end if there was any wisdom in them. How could one have chased a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and Yehovah had given them up? For those who refuse to walk in righteousness and yet carry Yehovah's name, he will give them up to their enemies. And I reckon the judgment will come very quickly, like a pot being smashed. But as we've seen, even in this, there is still compassion, even in this judgment. It's meant to bring people to repentance. So what does Moshe have to say about the name of Yehovah? He says, The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways of justice, Mishpat, a God of faithfulness. And the word there is Emunah. And without iniquity, he's just as a deek, or righteous, and upright, Yeshua is he. It is a good thing to know the name of Yehovah. So we're going to have a little look at this word, Emunah. And then we'll bring the first part to a close. Often translated as having faith or faithfulness. We have <clears throat> morally, fidelity, steady, truly, truth, verily, stability, firmness. Eminah has the verb root, a man often translated as believe, meaning to, to support or make firm. The concept that it embraces is firmness and certainty. From the parent root, of this we get the word amen which is the family support amen truth emet also comes from the parent root of this verb the parent root of a man is man which is mem noon there we have the letters <clears throat> so truth emet which comes from a man same root as a man truth is something we can be sure of it stands firm if we remove though the first letter of this hebrew word we get met thought this was interesting which means dead the first letter of a met is the aleph which as the first letter of the hebrew alphabet signifies the leader the strength and it's a picture of an ox string strong they often seem to represent yehovah so if our notion of the truth does not include yehovah then we are dead <laughs> now man the parent root it's the mem noon okay mem water noon seed when we add to a seed we get a plant that produces more seed seed contains all the information for growth so what we get when we add the water to the seed the information is activated it's acted upon the seed becomes a plant which in turn produces more seeds but there's continuity there isn't it something ongoing and please note that emuna this word that describes yehovah and a man which is believe are all related to this word man to believe contains the idea of something that is ongoing that has continuity a man believe means to make firm steady and to stabilize something that's stable and firm and steady is something that's ongoing isn't it that lasts it gives us the abstract concepts of sureness and certainty it also gives us the concrete idea of a kind a type a category or a group Man simultaneously means firm, certainty, and group. Man, the parent root of a man believe, can be found in the creation account. In fact, Genesis 1.11, God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yield and seed, and fruit bear and fruits in which there is seed, each according to its kind. And it's that word, man, on the earth, and it was so. So man is groups and categories. When kinds in Genesis 1 reproduced, they formed groups but categories that were stable, firm, and certain. All these concepts are at play at the same time. There are many words derived from man that are related to the idea of groups. Manet is something that's taken from a larger group of things as a portion. And we've got to count, 
to measure the size of a group. We've got likeness, mawant, similarity to things within a group. And truth, uh, conformance to a group of established facts, emet. And then we've got this word emunah, which is the tendency to remain grouped. This is the word faithfulness, to be with somebody in a state that is certain and sure and fair. Abraham is described as a man of faith in Hebrews 11. It says in Genesis 15, 6, he believed in the word that is a man, Yehovah, and he counted it to him as righteousness. A man in its simplest form is to support, confirm, be faithful, uphold, nourish, father, foster, to nurse, and it represents pillars, supporters of the door. And they all share the idea with maintenance, again, with something that is ongoing and continuous. And we've got amen. <clears throat> If you look at the ideas that are the foster nurse pillars, amen, when you shout that is, I will hold that up, I'll keep that from pulling apart, I will nourish and protect that, I'm into this, this is good. Belief looks like a pillar joined to a building which stands firm and resists the forces which threaten to tear the building apart. That's used in 2 Kings 18.6. Belief looks like an expert jeweler who utilizes training and designs to gather and assemble stones and metals into stable and enduring jewelry used as that as a cunning workman in song 7 Womp. Believe looks like a nurse who provides food and men's wounds to ensure strength, certainty, wholeness, the body are maintained. It's translated as nurse in Ruth 4.16. And believe looks like an apple seed that when it's watered sprouts, matures into a, to a tree and produces more seeds continuing the life of the tree, something that is ongoing. Now Abraham believed Yehovah's promises and had a persistent commitment to Yehovah which showed in his faithful life. He waited 25 years for a son and offered him back to Yehovah when he was asked. Even through trials, he remained firm. He was unwilling to break his ongoing relationship with Yehovah, but he remained grouped with him. He was steadfast. And this is something I was talking with JP about the other day. Abraham didn't have a Bible, yet he believed. His faith wasn't something that could be measured in terms of how many ticks he got on the list. Did he do that? Did he do this? Did he do the other? His faith was an attitude. It's all about where his heart was at. And it was an attitude of steadfastness. So many people can be obedient in many things and tick many boxes. But they do not have faith because they do not have the same attitude that we see in Abraham. They're not steadfast and firm in the same sense. Ask yourself, how are your robes looking? Might have ticked loads of boxes. Eminah contains the idea of steadfastness or persistence. Exodus 17. Joshua did as Moshe had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moshe, Aaron, and Hare went up to the top of the hill. It came to pass when Moshe held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moshe's hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hare held up his hands, one on either side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady. The word there is emunah, the same word used to describe Yehovah until the going down of the sun. Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Actually, it doesn't say the edge of the sword. The word pay is used, and it actually says, Joshua discomfited Amalek, Amalek and his people with the sword of his mouth, which is fascinating because it's a prophetic picture of Yeshua. Revelation 19, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that whether he should smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So, Moshe's hands down, defeat. Moshe's hands up, steady, emunah, victory. So here we have Moshe who represents the Torah, which is the truth, emets, which is related to emunah. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, thy Torah is the truth. So, this is Yehovah's truth, which brings life. Not the truth of the godless, which is no truth, but it's death. That many people can have loads of faith in as well. We have Moshe, the truth being held steady, emunah, and that brings victory. 
But m and speaks of certainty and firmness, of steadfastness and faithfulness. That which can be relied upon. Faithfulness. So Yehovah is a God of faithfulness, is Emunah. We can rely on Yehovah, he is certain, he stands firm. Emunah in the LXX, the Septuagint, is the Greek 4103. Pistos, often translated as trustworthy, related to the word believe. Whoever believes, and it's a related word, in the Son as eternal life. So, this is the belief from the Hebraic idea of what belief is. That person has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son does not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Please note that believing, having this faith and obedience are synonymous. Faith and belief that brings life, that brings victory, is holding steady to the truth, to the Torah, firmly being established in it. It is to be steadfastly obedient. They said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Shua answered them, he said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So did he mean just, oh yeah, I think he's, I think he's true, yeah, I think it's true. No. To believe in the Son is to believe in the truth, by the way, because Yeshua says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To believe is to support, to be steadfast. When we stand firm in the truth, the word, when our work in the truth is one of certainty, not one of, oh, maybe, perhaps, oh, I'll have a think about it, but one of absolute certainty, then we have victory, because that is emunah. Then we, like our God, are steady, we are full of faithfulness. Then we can call ourselves the people of faith. Then only when it is a certainty, an ongoing certainty, that we will uphold the truth, that we will walk in it, that it is an ongoing thing, not a thing to be questioned and all, maybe, perhaps, and all that. Because that's not the attitude. Then we are those who truly believe, those who have life, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. The one who believes in him stands firm with him. No matter what. He's grouped together in him. One body. Not off doing his own thing. Works to maintain wholeness in him. Is steadfastly obedient to his truth. This is what it means to believe. This is the one who has taken the words of life and acted on them like the seed that is activated by the water. When our walk in the truth is one of certainty, then, when our walk of absolute certainty, then we have victory. This is faith. This is what it is to believe. This is the attitude. This is what it means to be a manure, to be steadfast. Ask yourself, how are your robes looking? What about ticking boxes? This is about being completely and utterly faithful to Jehovah your God. Completely soul firm. Sure, certain. And ongoing. This is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Faith, same word. Belief comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Or rather by shemaing and shemaring the word of God. The one who shemars is the one who takes the words of life and acts on them like the seed that's activated by the water. It doesn't even question it. Is that what it says in his word? This is what I will do. It is certain that I will do this and I will continue doing this. To Shema, to Wazan, to give ear is to do the work of God. So Yehovah is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice, mishpat. He's a God of faithfulness, emunah. 
without iniquity. He's just righteous. He's upright. It is a good thing to know the name or the character of Yehovah. We can rely on Yehovah. He is certain and he stands firm. To you. Right, part two. <coughs> so, Yehovah is a God of faithfulness. Without iniquity, he's a deek. Yosha. And his ways are mishpat. We can rely on Yehovah. He is certain and he stands firm. We're to be like him. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And you were once alienated and hostile in mind due to evil deeds. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister, stable and steadfast. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion that they may believe what is false. In order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth. We know what it is to believe. We had pleasure in unrighteousness. We ought all to give thanks to our God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. For this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. So then, brothers, do what? Stand firm. Hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be strong. Be courageous. So, stand firm and let nothing move you. Hebrews. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for you who promised is faithful. He is Emunah. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Why? Their hearts are steadfast. And there's a word there, ku. They trust in Yehovah. And that word there, as you can see, I'll we'll put this on. Firm. <coughs> Certain faithfulness surely the righteous will never be shaken their hearts are steadfast trusting in Jehovah was so that you what good is it my brothers if someone says he has faith but does not have works in that faith save him the brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them go in peace be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body what good is that so also faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. So what James is doing here, he's speaking to people who don't actually understand what it is to have faith. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and should it. So he's delineating between this idea of, oh yeah, I believe. And actually truly believing and having faith. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Yitzhak on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says that Abraham believed, and it's this word again, G41, pistos or pistis, God, and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. But it's the same word there for Abraham, as in John 3.36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. James is simply making a distinction between you saying you believe something and actually believing it. As we've seen, believing is much more than agreeing that something is true. 
If I believe in Yeshua, then I will steadfastly stand firm with him and my actions will be indicative of my support for him. This is from, um, I thought this was interesting, this is from actually from like a, an evangelical Christian site, I think. It said, I used to wonder why God saved certain people just because they decided to adopt one particular set of beliefs over another, which is a very Greek way of thinking. But as James pointed out, Satan himself believes that Jesus died for the sins of the world and that he is God in the flesh. And just knowing that doesn't redeem him. But while Satan may have the right beliefs, he cannot say that he has emunah, a committed faithfulness to the Lord. What God asks for goes beyond an academic decision to believe that a certain set of facts are true. He wants faith in his promises that results in a steadfast faithfulness to him. Lois Zverberg. So Yelva is all these things. We can rely on him. He is certain and he stands firm. He's just, he is eminent, and he's also Zadik and Yeshua. Righteousness, Zadik, and justice, Mishpat, are the foundation of your throne. And then we have mention of steadfast love, Hesed, and faithfulness. It's actually a met there, which means truth go before you and Yehovah takes pleasures in those who fear him in those who hope in his has said in his mercy surely the righteous will never be shaken because their hearts are steadfast they trust in Yehovah Yehovah Zavayot is exalted in justice mishpat and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness Again, we see mention of Yehovah's justice, but here we see the connection between holiness and righteousness. Yehovah, the holy God, shows himself holy in righteousness. And he says, I am holy. I'm the Lord your God. I am holy. You must be holy too. He shows himself holy in righteousness. So let's go back to the phrase that James referred to regarding Abraham. It says he believed Yehovah and he counted to him as righteousness as a deacon. Here we also see belief, the verb root of emanah being mentioned along with righteousness, which is linked to being holy, which is what we are called to be. So what is it to be righteous? The word righteous is a translation of the Hebrew verb zadach, which means to walk in a straight line. Is it from the lexicon? To be right, straight, as of a straight way, stiff, rigid. From this we get the noun zadik, just, lawful, and righteous. This noun also means a straight line. So the righteous one, the one who shows themselves to be holy, as Yehovah is holy, is the one who walks in a straight line. And in the English language, a wicked person is one who performs evil, destructive, or hateful acts. However, in the Hebrew language, the noun rasha, Strong's H7563, has a very different meaning. The noun is derived from the Hebrew verb rasha and literally means to depart from the path. Psalm 18, I have kept the ways of Yehovah and have not wickedly departed from my God. The phrase wickedly departed is also the word rasha. A wicked person is one who departs from the path where a righteous person is straight. A wicked person is crooked. So how did the song go? The people were described as being blemished and being crooked and twisted. Foolish and senseless in whom there is no faithfulness, no eminat. And no understanding is in them. Proverbs 2 says this. Yehovah gives wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. And the word there is Yesha, And it means straight and level. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. Guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. His saints are those who walk straight on level ground. Those who stick to the paths of righteousness. His saints... Those who like Yehovah are Zadik, and also we see here Yesha, straight and level. And we've looked at what it means to be blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the Torah of Yehovah, and on his Torah he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers, he's blessed. So, blessed is the man. <clears throat> blessed, what is it? A share, be blessed, to be happy. 
it's from the root ashur or shur, shur, primitive root which means to be straight and to be level well, blessed and happy is the one that is straight and level blessed and happy is the one that meditates on the Torah the verb root of Torah the flow the lay or throw to point out so blessed is the one that lets Yehovah's word point out to him the way in which he should go the one who doesn't then deviate from the path so to be blessed and happy is to be straight and level blessed is the one who was righteous the righteous walk in Yehovah's commands and they are steadfast emunah all these things are connected to them the paths of life are straight and level Yehovah is Yasha, he is straight and level and to know him and walk in his ways is to be blessed which in the Hebrew also is straight and level he is sure and the righteous trust in him David's prayer was teach me to do your will I like to do your will your Torah is within my heart you are my God let your good spirit lead me on a level ground and we read didn't we just before the righteous will never be shaken their hearts are steadfast trusting in the Lord and trust in the book of Proverbs trust in Yehovah with all your heart do not lean on your own understanding which so many people do in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight yes you are your paths in other words if you do this you will be blessed let your good spirit lead me on level ground we've suggested that if you're someone that is always facing mountains in your life then maybe you've strayed from the path your life's one big drama after another big drama you've probably strayed from the path that's not suggest that if you're facing a tough time that you've wandered off Jehovah will often allow us to go through trials in order to test our faith which is different from living a life that is just one drama after another an ongoing cycle of chaos just like it's different when you rebel and Jehovah turns his face from you to when you face persecution for standing for him James 1 count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness again this is something that we should strive for it should be a part of who we are just as it's a part of who Jehovah is let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing in this rejoice and again the scriptures call us to be a people of thanksgiving though now for a little while if necessary you've been grieved by various trials please note it says if necessary so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Yeshua I'm a Shiak. Though now you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And it's the same word, G4101. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It's the same belief that we've talked of. Same belief, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life same belief that speaks of firmness of support of steadfastness and this is what it is that leads to life you believe in him in this way and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible if you believe in him in this way we give thanks even in trials remember in all circumstances this is the will of god in christ jesus for you james 1 blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial no matter what is going on <clears throat> truly I say to you whoever hears my word and believes same word for beliefs has eternal life he doesn't come into judges but his judgment but has passed from death to life but never without reason to give thanks to Jehovah rejoice always pray without ceasing give thanks in all circumstances but this is the will of God and Yeshua HaMashiach for you do not quench the spirit rejoice always give thanks it is Yehovah's will this is what it being blessed is all about this is what so many people fail to do doing the will of Yehovah doing righteousness being upright Yeshua straight and level is to be blessed which is also to be straight and level recognize the wonder of what Yehovah has done for you and respond with gratitude Think of how much that he has loved you. And if you truly have faith, 
if you stand firm in his word, if you are steadfast and walk in righteousness, then you will trust in Jehovah completely. And his promises will be so real to you that your joy will be inexpressible. But if you're somebody who just doesn't get it, who has the wrong attitude, no. Gracious is Jehovah and righteous our God is merciful. The psalmist says, what shall I render to Jehovah for all his benefits to me? What can I give him? He's given me so much. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of Jehovah. I'll give him thanks. I'll pay my vows to Jehovah in the presence of all his people. That which I have said I would do. To completely surrender to him and to walk with him. Completely submitted. I will do this. And I will do it with thanksgiving. May my meditation be pleasing to him. For I rejoice in Jehovah. I give him thanks. I do not forget him. I come before him just as he asked me to. I acknowledge him in all the things that my hands accomplish. In all the things in which I am blessed. And ask yourself, do you believe? Because if you truly believe, you will have joy. And ask yourself, how are your robes looking? The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways of justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright, straight and level is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. They've departed from the path. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is he not your father who created you, who made you and established you? Speaks of ingratitude. This foolishness. It puts me in mind of Isaiah 5. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes. But it yielded wild grapes. So he did absolutely everything he could. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Do you thus repay the Lord? Now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they may not rain upon it. You foolish and sense, senseless people. Foolish people failing to acknowledge that it is Jehovah who establishes them, as we read before. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear Jehovah our God. He gives the rain and the season, the autumn rain, the spring rain, and keeps for us the two weeks appointed for the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away, and your sins have kept good from you. There is no understanding in them. For the vineyard of Jehovah Zavayot is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, oppression. And the Hebrew words for justice and bloodshed or oppression sound alike. Mishpat and Mishpach. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. And the words there sound alike too. Zedekah and Se'achah. Isaiah tells of Jehovah looking for Mishpat and Zedekah amongst his people and finding them. And then he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'll remove its heads and it will be devoured. I'll break down its wall and it will be trampled down. I will make it a waste. Those calling themselves God's people and taking pleasure in unrighteousness think that all is well. 
But Yehovah will remove his protection. And as we saw earlier, it can come very, very quickly. Yehovah, gracious, kind and merciful, but also is a God of judgment. We know him who said, vengeance is mine and I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The God that can do all that he wills. They've dealt corruptly with him. They deal corruptly with him to this very day. A crooked and twisted generation, they've strayed from the path to righteousness. Oh no, we won't go there. We'll go our own way. They are not upright, yes, you are straight and level. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is basically all idioms for saying, those who take my words of life and put something else in its place. Woe to these people. That's exactly what people do. Christianity in general has done it, and people in their own little lives do it too. It says in his word to do this, but actually I'm going to remove that and I'm going to put this in its place. I'm going to do this instead. I don't really want to do that. Ah, I'll just twist it around a bit and I'll put this darkness there instead. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Yeah, this will be good. The Lord says to do this, but I think I know better. I'll do this instead. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Just think about how many people this is addressing. Maybe it's addressing you. Maybe you've said, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to do this instead. Because this and because that and because the other. I know what his word says, but you know what? I think it makes more sense for me personally to do this instead. It's addressing all those who think to put darkness for light. That's exactly what it's doing. What did the scriptures say? Woe to those who do that. That is to choose sin. What is sin? It's a transgression of the Torah. They are wise in their own eyes. They are fools before Yehovah. Though. Senseless and foolish people. They trust in themselves and they are crooked See, surely the righteous will never be shaken. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in Yehovah. Proverbs 3. Trust in Yehovah with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he, he will make straight your paths. And what is it to be straight and to be level? It is to be blessed. But all these people who want to walk in their own wisdom, those that are crooked, those that the Lord describes as wicked, those who might recite his statutes and might take their covenant on his lips. Foolish and senseless people. The Ovar is the creator of all things. By the power of his word, all things are held together. He is sovereign over all things. Job 42. I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. But I know better, don't I? Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, the foolish and senseless that deal corruptly with Jehovah. But I know that Jehovah is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever Jehovah pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. And yet people think, ah, I'll do it my way. There is no understanding in them. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations and ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. I think that actually in other translations talks about numbers of the, the um, sons of God and I think it's talking about the principalities and powers that reign over certain regions of the earth. But the Lord's portion is his people. Yaakov is his allotted heritage. Now the next few verses could well have prophetic significance. It says, He found him in a desert land in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. As we know, everything is cyclical. 
Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. Yehovah alone guided him, no foreign god was with him. He made him ride high in the high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he suckled him with honey out of the rock. And the word there for rock is Selah, which we also know as the name of a place, which is also known as Petra and Bozra. And oil out of the flinty rock. The word there for rock is different. It's the usual word for rock. And Bozra should be a place of interest to us because it says in Micah 2, I will surely assemble, O Yaakov, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozra. Bozra actually means sheepfold as well. As the flock in the midst of their fold, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. So he suckled him with honey out of the rock. Bozra. Leads me to think of Revelation 12. The woman, which is referring to Israel, fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. And then we get the imagery of the eagle once more. The woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she's to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. So what we have a description of here is those who can be counted as Israel, being kept safe, being nourished. Isaiah 26 says, Come, my people, enter your chambers, shut your doors behind you, hide yourselves for a little while until the fury or the wrath has passed by. There are those who will go through the tribulation, the plagues, as it were. They've counted themselves as Jehovah's, but they have not had their ransom paid. And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. They will have their heads lifted up. But they will then be numbered by what? By being beheaded. But there are also those who can be numbered, who will be kept safe. There they are, numbered and sealed. And it says in Revelation 14, I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. These are people who know the name of their God. It's these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. They haven't gone after false religions and all that nonsense. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind. It's first fruits to God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was no lie found. For they are blameless. These are without blemish. Whilst we see troubles in the Song of Moshe for those who have dealt corruptly with Yehovah, we also know that Yehovah hears the cry of the righteous. As I said earlier, we can see through the Scriptures who it is that Yehovah responds to. Yehovah is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and he saves them. This point we'll turn to another song. <clears throat> That's the song of David. David spoke to Yehovah the words of this song on the day when Yehovah delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, Yehovah is my rock, and there is that word again, Selah, and the fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, that's the usual word for rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon Yehovah who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. In my distress, I called upon Yehovah, to my God I called from his temple. He heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. That's amazing picture, honestly. <laughs> In his temple, he heard his cry. Compare this with those who do not hearken to his voice, as described in Proverbs 1. The Lord says, if you turn at my proof, reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I've called, though, and you refuse to listen, I've stretched out my hand, and no one is heeded. Because you ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. So the Lord's tried to chastise people to bring them back, to, to discipline them. They won't even listen to that. He says, so I will laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind and distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I won't answer. They will seek me diligently, but it will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Jehovah. They would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. And verse 33 shows us again that Jehovah hears the cry of the righteous. Whoever listens to me, whoever shamas, will dwell secure and be at ease without dread of disaster. 
For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The Lord is far from the wicked. Remember who the wicked can be. The wicked can be those who recite his statutes and hold his covenant on their lips. But he hears the prayer of the righteous. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. And if you read the song of Moshe, you'll see, wow, this is what comes upon a people who do not walk after their God, who do not shema. Back to the song of David, we again see that Jehovah, he is the righteous. He sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but Jehovah was my support. He brought me to a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Jehovah dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He rewarded me. That's something to note, isn't it? For I have kept the ways of Jehovah and not acted wickedly or departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. And Jehovah has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. How are your robes looking? With the merciful you show yourself merciful, with the blameless man you show yourself blameless. The purified you deal purely and with the crooked you make yourself seem tortuous. You save a humble people but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. Those who are wise in their own eyes. For you are my lamp, O Yehovah, and my God lightens my darkness. By you I can run against the troop and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of Yehovah proves true. He's a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but Yehovah, and who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. Please note that Yehovah gets all the glory in the song of David. For all his success, David gives Yehovah credit. It is a good thing to know the name of Yehovah. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He knows exactly who I am. When he calls to me, I'll answer him and I'll be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and I will honor him. With long life, I'll satisfy him and show him my salvation, my Yeshua. So back to the song of Moshe. He made him ride in the high places of the land and he ate the produce of the field and suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Curds from the herd and milk from the flock with fat of lambs, rams of Bashan and goats, the very finest of the wheat. And you drank foaming wine made from the blood of the grape, which does indeed sound very nourishing. It says, but Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. He grew fat, stout and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scoffed. That's Nabel, which means lightly esteemed, <clears throat> amongst other things, despised at the rock of his salvation. They stared into jealousy with strange gods with abominations they provoked into anger. They sacrificed the demons that were no gods to gods they had never known to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you. You forgot the God that gave you birth. So, Jeshruin grew fat and kicked. They kicked Ba'at. This is the first use of this verb in the Torah. It's to trample down, despise, kick. The picture is that not only refusing to submit to the will of Jehovah, but actually striking out at him or her in an act of defiance. Not only disobeying Jehovah, but proclaiming that his word, his perfect law of liberty, his bondage would be a good example of this. So, Yeshruan or Yeshruan, upright one. A poetical or ideal title of Israel derived from Yeshar, upright, straight and level. It's held to connect a tacit reference to the name Israel, of which the first three consonants are almost the same as those of Jeshu Ram. In Numbers 23.10, the term the righteous ones, Yeshavim, is supposed to contain a similar reference. So this name is a reference to Israel being upright. So Yeshurun, Yehovah's holy nation, they're meant to be a Shema people, aren't they? 
people who walk in righteousness and have we seen the connection between righteousness and holiness already so who is his nation if you shema my voice then you'll be a kingdom of priests to me and a holy nation people of faith who act in accordance with his word yes you run are supposed to be yesha Yehovah gives you wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, for those who are Yeshua. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, to those who are his people. God in the paths of justice, Mishpat, and watching over the way of sentence. Then you will understand righteousness and justice. These are all titles that are associated, or aspects of the, that are associated with Yehovah's name. Mishpat and Zedekiah and equity in every good path for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul discretion will watch over and over you understanding will guard you delivering you from the way of evil from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of rightness and that's your share from your share to walk in the ways of darkness to rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil men whose paths are crooked men who are evil and wicked and who are devious in their ways Okay, these are people who reject what the Lord's got to offer. Reject his wisdom. And we know the Torah of Yehovah is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. But what's the thing that the Lord says about these people? They are senseless and they are foolish people. Yehovah saw it and he spared them because of the prov provocation of his sons and his daughters. He said, I'll hide my face from them and I'll see what their end will be. They are a perverse generation, children in whom there is no faithfulness. A moon from a man. But they're not like Yehovah in any way, shape, or form because they have refused his wisdom, which as we've seen, we get from his word. So far we've seen that in those that call themselves Yehovah's people, those that carry his name, those who are called to be Yeshru Ran, upright in Yeshua, there is no Mishpat, no Zedekah, and no Emunah. And it's all because they reject his wisdom. The Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk in completeness. But what do they do? They put darkness for light. They reject his wisdom and they reject his, his word. Because what? They're wise in their own eyes. We don't need the wisdom of the Lord. His word says this, but no, we'll do this. Isaiah 5, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. And sadly, that is lots and lots of people. Maybe it's just in a small aspect of their lives that they are wise in their own eyes. It is a good thing to know the name of the character of Yehovah. If you want to know his name, turn to his word. Don't make up who he is for yourself. Turn to his word. Jehovah is perfect. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. All these aspects that are missing in his people, those who call themselves his people. A God of faithfulness, emunah, and without iniquity, just, zadik, and upright, Yeshua is he. And we're supposed to be like him. But those who carry his name, are none of these. Exodus 20. You shall not carry the name of Jehovah your God falsely, for Jehovah will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So this is, this is not some small matter. This is a big deal. So ask yourself, how are your robes looking as you go about carrying his name? You walk in your own wisdom. When our walk in the truth is one of certainty, so it's not even questionable, then we have victory. And that is faith, and that is what it is to believe. That is what it is to have life. That is what it is to belong to Him. And yet, so people, few people have this. Rather than turn into His Word and the wisdom that is in His Word, they'll turn to their own wisdom. Because they do not have this steadfastness. They do not have true belief. This is the attitude that we're to have. That our walk in the truth is one of certainty.
It is sure. <laughs> right, part three. <coughs> Isaiah 66, 4. <coughs> I will choose harsh treatment for them and bring their fears upon them because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not shimmer. They did what was evil in my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. Many people, do you know, do exactly that. What was more that I could have done for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? What's going on? The people described as, in the Song of Moshe, blemished, crooked and twisted, foolish and senseless people. Children in whom there is no emunat, no understanding in them. Well, it says, they have made me jealous with what is no God and have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So here we have the Lord talking about jealousy and anger. Jehovah is emotional and is not a bit of ashamed of it. He's neither afraid of nor ruled by emotions. Either they his or ours. But in John 11, we read of Yeshua. When Mary came to where Yeshua was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Yeshua saw her weeping, the Jews who had come with her also weeping, and smoked the word there, Cleo, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then it says Yeshua wept, and it's a different word. And the word used means not cry of lamentation or the wail of excessive grief, but calm shedding of tears because he felt an emotion. When he drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it. There's nothing wrong with or inherently evil in the emotions of anger or jealousy. Paul taught us to be angry and yet not sin. He also taught, told us he was jealous for us with a godly jealousy. It's not emotions of anger and jealousy that present a problem, but the potential for evil that comes from our fleshly responses to the emotion and from coping mechanisms we choose to employ to deal with them. And if we can understand that, we can understand that neither Yehovah's jealousy nor his anger is anything which should cause us to recoil from him. I remember reading, or seeing rather, a thing where Oprah Winfrey explained why she no longer wanted to be Christian or go to a church. She said, because she read about the Lord being jealous, and she thought, I can't follow a God that's jealous. Thought, well. <clears throat> they have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols, so I'll make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For the fire is kindled by my anger, and it burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth in its increase, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now earlier in the song of Moshe, <coughs> we read, they have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because what? Because they are blemished. They are crooked and a twisted generation. Okay. Blemished is shikath. It means corrupted, spoiled, marred. So a fire is kindled by my anger and it burns to the depths of Sheol. It will devour the earth and its increase. 2 Peter 3 we read the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed since all these things are thus to be dissolved what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. And be at peace. Blemish. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. 
Okay, Jude 1 tells us this. Our garment is ruined. Others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment spotted by the flesh. By walking after the flesh, we defile our garments. And what is walking after the flesh? The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of God, neither indeed can be. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. The song of Moshe is a witness. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. There are many folk calling themselves Jehovah's people and yet they go after the flesh, which as we've just seen, is refusing to submit to his word. Maybe for the most part they do submit in most areas. But there's a blemish. Always that certain thing. His people are to be without blemish. And he says, and I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows on them. They should be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I will send the teeth of beasts against them with the venom of things that crawl in the dust. Outdoors the sword shall be even indoors terror for young man and woman alike, the nurse and child with the man of grey hairs. Pretty severe. I would have said I will cut them to pieces, I will wipe them from human memory. Had I not feared the provocation by the enemy, lest their adversaries should misunderstand, lest they should say, our hand is high, it was not Yehovah who did all this. In other words, I will say, oh, look, aren't we great? This is brilliant. We did all this. But they are a nation, what void of counsel, there is no understanding in them. If they were wise, where they get wisdom from, we get it from his word. They would understand this and they would discern their latter end. But they're not wise. And Yehovah says they're foolish and senseless people. And for all those who are wise in their own sight, remember what we read earlier. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. And if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword and he has bent his bow and readied his bow. Sorry. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. And we saw what it is. It's the foam at the mouth to be enraged to find something abominable to absorb something. Indignation. The Lord said, what? Well, if you will turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you and make my word known to you. In other words, if you will repent. Which is different from saying, why has the Lord done all this? We have done nothing wrong. And judgment will come, bang, really quick, like a pot being smashed. Because, you have called, because I have called and you refuse to listen, I've stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. This is why. I speak to you. I've confronted with you. I've sent people to speak my truth to you. To say, stop doing this. Stop walking in your own wisdom. Submit and surrender to me. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. And yet, even though I send these people to speak to you, to try to get through to you, you just don't want to know. You want to have nothing of it. Oh, you're talking about that. Oh, yeah, well, oh, well. And then he says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. If you turn at my reproof, how many will claim to be righteous? How many will fail to see that they are blemished? Yeah, I'm righteous. I do this. I do. No, yeah, I'll do that instead. But, I, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. How many will continue to put darkness for light when it suits them? How many? I really don't understand it. It's total foolishness. How many will have gotten Yehovah's name wrong? These things you've done and have been silent. You thought I was one like yourself. You got my name wrong. But now I rebuke you and I lay the charge before you.
How could one have chased a thousand and two have put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and Yehovah had given them up? But the rock is not as our rock. Our enemies are by themselves. In other words, think of, how could they have the ability to come and overrun you? They haven't even got a God. Their vine comes from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison. Their clusters are bitter. The wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of asps. Our enemies are by themselves. They have no gods. They have gods, rather, but they are no gods. Those of the world who run after the things of the world. Yehovah is saying that all the calamity that will come will be by his doing. So for all those people who think, wow, yeah, I'm just carrying on. Actually, I'm quite righteous, yeah. I'll put darkness for light where it suits me. Oh, let's ignore these blemishes. When all the trouble comes, it will be by Yehovah's hand. And this is something that you will have to accept. But it is all meant to bring his people to repentance. says when you were in tribulation all these things come upon you in the latter days then you will return to Yehovah your God and then you will shema his voice for Yehovah your God is a merciful God he will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them an act of mercy to bring so many people to wake up to the fact that wow my robes are absolutely filthy Oh, oh no, I have a blemish here. Oh no, I walk my own wisdom. I profess to have belief, but I'm not steadfast. When it comes to his truth, I question it. I'm not certain and sure on it. But Yehovah, your God is a merciful God. Isaiah 49. Zion said, Yehovah has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. He says, but can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. It's really sad, isn't it? It's really sad. all this is an act of mercy the tribulation those whom I love I reprove and discipline be zealous and repent for there are a great multitude that no one could number from every nation might come out of this tribulation what clothed in white robes clothed in white robes how are your robes looking Yehovah will bring judgment on his people. Then he will bring judgment on the instruments of his rebuke. 34. Is this not laid up in store with me, sealed up in my treasuries? Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. For Yehovah will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. It is a good thing to know the name of Yehovah. Ezekiel 20. You shall know that I am Yehovah when I deal with you for my name's sake. Not according to your evil ways, not according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel, declares the Lord God. And he will say, where are their gods, the rock in which they took refuge? The fanciful, imagined gods of their own nonsense. Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. And this includes the God that many Torah keepers follow. 
The one that is cool with them doing only which bits they are comfortable with. Out of his word. The God that lets you get all Hebraic while still remaining blemished. These things you have done and have been silent. You thought I was one like you. You were wrong. If you want to know the name of Jehovah, turn to his word. Now I rebuke you and I lay the charge before you. See now that I, even I, am he and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. There is none that can deliver out of my hand, you foolish and senseless people. But I lift up my hand to heaven and I swear as I live forever. If I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and will repay those who hate me. Who are those who hate Jehovah? Jehovah. Psalm 81. Those who hate Jehovah would feign obedience to him. Wow. And their time of punishment would be forever. Those who hate Jehovah. To love Jehovah. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments and not burdensome. To feign obedience though is to hate him. Jehovah says, I will repay those who hate me. What an insult. Do you feign obedience to Jehovah? Those who feign obedience know nothing of Emunah. They know nothing of the steadfast faith that leads to life. They may be somewhat obedient. But the attitude is not there. When pressed, they choose to be wise in their own eyes. And they put darkness for light. It's... Oh. They lean on their own understanding. How totally stupid. They walk around declaring with their lips their love for Jehovah. They feign obedience because although they believe, they do not aman. There is no emunah. And time goes on and the song tells us what will be. And there is an inevitability to what we read. Surely though the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in Jehovah. Are you to be found among the righteous? Or amongst those trying to convince themselves and everybody else that they are righteous, feigning obedience, walking with sin in your life? Jeremiah 17, blessed is the man who trusts in Jehovah, whose trust is in Jehovah. Not in his own understanding or his own wisdom. The righteous one, the one who shows themselves to be holy, is the one who walks in a straight line. The one who does not depart from the path. He is upright, yes, sure, straight, level, blessed. Be careful, be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law, all of it. Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the left, to the right hand or to the left. That you might be blessed, that you might have good success wherever you go. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the beginning of revenge is upon the enemy. Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods, for he avenges the blood of his children, takes vengeance on his adversaries, he repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. So Jehovah will make atonement for his people and for the land. His people, those who are like him. Emunah, Zedekah, and Yeshua. Those who know his name. And the day will come for all those who have been washed in the water of the word. 
those who were found without blemish. And let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And it was, and to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. How are your robes looking? It is a good thing to know the name, the character of Yehovah. Bless you, Lord. the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are justice he's a God of faithfulness he's without iniquity he's just and he's upright ask yourself are you someone that has true faith When our walk in the truth is one of certainty, then we have victory. This is faith. This is what it is to believe. This is the attitude. This is what it is to be Jehovah's. So be careful to do all the words of this law but it is no empty word for you for your very life. Shall we pray? Lord, you are so very good. How awful those calling themselves your people would deal so terribly with you how amazing Lord that you still have such compassion and mercy how much you've done for us Lord There is nobody like you. Such kindness and love. Oh Lord. Feel so terrible about what people have done in your name. Forgive us please, Lord, I ask. Your name is wonderful. I love your name, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you. Amen.